Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? We are here with another podcast with Ted Rice and Stuart. Uh, what is your last name, Stuart? Uh, Eglinton. Eglinton. Stuart Eglinton. So we're here together to talk about Ted's experiences. And also, we're going to talk about how Stuart and Ted met and how are they doing a podcast in YouTube talking about test experiences and they talk about mainly about Carla Turner and the book, The Masquerade of Angels. So welcome you guys. How are you guys doing? Uh, hello, Laura. Thank you for inviting me and Stuart to be on your podcast. We appreciate that. Uh, Stuart and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll let him tell you. He knows more of the details because he was the one that initiated this. It wasn't me. Uh, I had been uh, kind of uh, retired as far as doing uh, UFO alien investigation work for a number of years uh, since Carla died, actually, in 1995, I think it was, or 96. Uh, I had uh, pretty much gone into seclusion as far as uh, that goes. And Stuart uh, managed somehow to get to Elton Turner, Carla's husband, and talk uh, to him. And then Stuart contacted me uh, through Elton, and we started communicating. He invited me uh, to let's try doing a podcast and I was somewhat reluctant of uh, reluctant about it at first because it had been so many years I, I wasn't I wasn't sure what all I could remember I'm much older now and I was a little apprehensive about it but uh, something inside kind of nudged me that I needed to do this and uh, Stuart was the uh, first person that came along, and I've had I've had a number of people over the years invite me to do something similar, and I always declined. But uh, Stuart was uh, uh, very persuasive. He twisted my arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I got in, I got in touch with Elton, and um, Elton passed uh, Ted's email on to me. And that's how me and Ted started co corresponding. Mm -hmm. And we were, it must have been about a month or two. And to be honest, like we got on so well together that I I kind of got the idea to do the podcast. And then I asked Ted if he was interested in doing it. And he agreed to do it. Um, To be honest, like I, I, I didn't think I had to twist your arm too much, Ted. I, th I thought like you, you were... Uh, <laughs> I thought at this stage, like you, you were, you wanted to get your story out there, and you wanted to tell people about it because yeah. people had a lot of questions, especially with Carla and Barbara, and you know, you had disappeared, and then there was things on the internet. Was Ted Royce real? Was he a real person? And uh, you are, you are a very real person. Yeah, I'm glad you investigated Stuart, and I'm glad you reached out to him, and he actually agreed. And thank you so much for both of you to come on to this um, podcast. And I really appreciate it. And we've been talking on and off um, for all this. What? It's been, what, a month or two months? I don't remember. Oh, it must have been. Uh, or more. <laughs> yeah, since November, at least. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, since November. Um, but we're going to start with Ted's um, experiences. Ted. Tell us a little bit about yourself for the people that don't know anything about the book, Carla, uh, nothing. They don't know anything about it. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started working with Carla, and how did Carla put your um, experiences in her book, The Masquerade of Angels? Okay, well, uh, I had been do I worked, I worked all my working years uh i worked as a credit manager for a, a large uh, national corporation uh on the side i did psychic readings because i had been trained to do that years back when i lived in atlanta georgia 
through the National Institute Spiritual Association of Churches. And so I did those readings and worked in the psychic field for uh, uh, many years, actually, uh, the, the metaphysical work, you might call it. Uh, but I had strange experiences that happened to me over the years that I always thought, and I believe that I had been uh, programmed to think this, that uh, these events were angelic and that uh, I was actually being visited by angels from heaven. And uh, I can't say I was 100% convinced of that, but I didn't know anything about UFOs or aliens. And uh, I hadn't I had read very little. I hadn't talked to that many people that had seen anything or knew anything any more than I did. So I took that approach that, well, maybe these uh, beings that had visited me were angels. And uh, then an event happened. Uh, I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana. I think it was 1988 or 89. Uh, actually, I think it was 89. Uh, and, and it was the fourth day of April, 1989, yes. And I was living in a mobile home in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I had an event that not only changed my life, but it brought Carla and Barbara into the arena on this and a whole new perspective of my angels was born out of this. And that's how I met uh, Barbara and, and Carla. Uh, word got around to Carla Turner that uh, I had had uh, an, a, an alien UFO abduction in my there in my home in my trailer park and it not only involved me but it involved my neighbors as well and that was true mm -hmm. and Carla heard of this and of course she jumped on it and uh, it, it was like when Carla we first met it, it was like two old friends we'd never we'd never heard of each other we'd never seen each other but it was we hit it off just uh like two old friends that hadn't seen each other in a few years and you know it just flew from there barbara was the same way and i ha i have to say i don't know how Stuart feels but i kind of felt this way with him uh also it's like two old souls reconnecting uh but but anyway that's how i got involved with carla and and barbara okay thank you for that and why did you want to learn how to do the psychic work what compelled you to go and search for this group okay uh it always even in my teen years when i first heard of the uh psychic gene dixon and uh, our friend uh janet appleby has written about her and her story uh occasionally you'd hear something back then in the 50s uh in the newspaper something about her and that always intrigued me a little bit but not greatly but just enough that I, I would stop and listen or i would read what was there and so there was a little bit of interest i have to admit was going back many years but then uh, what really triggered the whole thing was in the early 60s, I lived for four years in Sun Valley, Idaho. And uh, while there, I met a beautiful young lady uh, that I've, we've written about in Masquerade of Angels. Her name was Maya. And at that time, I thought she was an unusual, uh, beautiful, beautiful young lady, uh, very unusual, but... Uh, uh, I, I, <clears throat> I, I thought she was uh, different from, from any earth person, human I had ever known. Even back then, I thought that, but it never occurred to me she might be an alien. Uh, 
but at any rate she uh tricked me into discovering that i could sort of read people or 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 not maybe deep readings but that just by the characteristics of the person their expressions the tone of their voice i could tell a lot of things about them and and she was the first one to tell me i had psychic abilities and and then you know years after that after i had left sun valley and i, re I returned back in the southern part of the united states where i was from uh i moved over to atlanta georgia and i got connected there with uh, a group from the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, and I fit I fit right in with these people, and I trained, and I learned to do readings. So that's how it came about. Great, great. So Maya is the one that kind of instigated or made you think about your definitely, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Stuart, do you want to add something? Do you want to add how you? became aware of Ted. Obviously you read the book, but uh, what inspired you to go and look for the Ted Rice that was written about in the book? <laughs> the, uh, yes, I, I was obsessed with Carla Turner. I was definitely a Carla fanboy. Uh, watched everything I could find on YouTube about her. Uh, got her books, read all her books. And um, I kind of found in a lot of ways, okay, the, the, the journey she went on through the abduction, like it started off with her own experiences coming to terms with it. And then later on, she go, uh, sets up her own research group and she's getting information from a taken was about the lives of eight women. And uh, then later on, it leads into masquerade of angels and it gets involved in all that kind of psychic stuff. But it, it's, you can't like, you can't, that's, you can't jump into that straight away. Like, if I start talking about psychic stuff to someone who doesn't even believe in aliens, they're not going to believe any of it, you know? Um, so I kind of found that my whole journey kind of matched that same path. And it wasn't until that I was I was years and years into it that I kind of started accepting, actually, maybe there's, there is something behind the whole psychic thing. And that's exactly what Carla was talking about herself. Like, it, it was like, it was all mapped out, like, my journey and her journey were nearly exactly the same like how we came to believe in the same things and um so i uh i think elton might have posted something on facebook i, I think this is what happens and that's when i kind of got the idea to uh contact ted okay now later on I, i've been talking to ted about this and uh ted you're kind of convinced that I might have been pushed in a way to do it. And it's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? When you think like your thoughts aren't your own. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's that's kind of how, how it all came to be. Oh, great. Great. So it's interesting how we all come together. Look yeah. at us here. I mean, we met in November, around November. I met you guys because my friends, uh, Argentinian friends that have... Um, podcast and YouTube, they asked me to be the translator for you guys. Um, my channel is in Spanish, mostly all of it. And um, I said, yeah, great. Of course I will, because I knew of uh, Carla Turner. And of course I knew about her book. And um, I said, yes, I will do it. Uh, I was elated. I was really, really excited to do this with you guys. And then we became friends. We are in constant communication. So I love that. I love how the kind of like the strings are moved, you know, and we just go with our intuition and we follow it. We flow with it. And then we become friends. That's how it all started with my friendships with all these people that are in this. Uh, we're talking about this. Um, and I love the, I love the idea that they kind of work us into wanting to know more, into pushing us 
into going forward and just sending an email, sending a message, hey, do you want to do an interview? Or I'm really interested in your experiences. And in this case, it's, it's, it's real easily, for me, it's real easy to get somebody and in, in come and talk on the show. I don't know if it happens to you too. I think it does, Stuart. I think it happens bit, to you yeah. too. It's like you get a, a name, it pops in your head, and then you go with it and you go for it. And then it's just flow, it just flows. And it, I, I love that. I love that about this experiences. Now, um, Ted, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the book for the people that don't know and they've never read the book? Can you tell us what is the book about? Masquerade is my life story. It starts when, uh, of course, the, the main focus is on abductions and what came out of those and how it affected my life. But I didn't know enough to actually see that I had had a lifelong manipulation. Carla saw it immediately because she started recordings of just, well, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about this. You know, it's it's an inquiry with, with me. And the more I talked, the, the more excited she got. And eventually, eventually she made me realize that I had had an entire lifelong manipulation to get me where I was. And she thought that was extremely important to my story that people realize that we are being manipulated maybe not everyone but i certainly was and uh that you know that's how it came about uh and it's basically about it, uh, my uh abductions and and what brought them on what led up to them and what came out of them and uh can i just throw something in here um Ted, even like, you know, me and you met each other, you and Carla met each other, but what is this force that's pushing all this happen? What's all this force that's making the, all this happen? Well, we don't know because it doesn't show itself, but it appears to be at this point benevolent. And if I have reached the point that most probably as we continue research or people behind us into the future they're going to come to the reality that there's a dual force working one favors humanity and the other one is out to destroy it uh or certainly uh make it look idiotic and foolish and and whatever uh to to destroy its image as far as being godly mm. mm -hmm. And um, can you tell us the experience that changed your mind about these beings, uh, especially about Maya? Tell us who Maya is. Well, I didn't know enough about Maya to tell anyone. I had mentioned uh, the first time I actually I mentioned Maya publicly was uh, Shirley MacLaine wrote a book called Out on a Limb. And uh, Stuart, do you know who Shirley MacLaine is? She's a, yeah, 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 uh, the actress. Okay. So, uh, at any rate, uh, that set me on fire. I mean, my God, someone else had met Maya. Uh, what is behind this girl? So I did share that with a few family members, but I'd never called her by name to anyone. Other, Were you I may. I may have mentioned a time or two that I had met this uh, beautiful, strange young lady at Sun Valley, but I, I, I never named her until that book came out. Mm -hmm. Was Shirley MacLaine's uh, version of Maya the same as yours? Like, same descriptions? Uh, it's been so long since I read that book, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, remember. there must have been something. But I think she had, a very, she had a very positive outlook about Maya. And as far as uh, what Maya, Maya did to me that I remembered uh, was good. Uh, it wasn't until years later under hypnotic regression with Barbara that I saw 
some surprising events had occurred with Boggy that I was not aware of. Tell us some experiences that you had with Maya, physical experience that you had with Maya, um, like for instance, when she asked you for a ride. Because you've met her physically. When she asked me for a ride? Yeah, to take her to her friends or oh, right. okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I came out of the lodge where I was working. And of course, bingo, right out of nowhere, Maya comes walking up and uh, we chat and I tell her I'm going down to the village, down the highway, uh, which I don't know, maybe a couple of miles, three miles down the highway from Sun Valley and uh, it was Ketchum, Idaho. And so she immediately said, oh, can I get a ride? I'm to meet some friends down there. And uh, I said, sure. So we get in my, we go to the parking area and get in my car and we ride down the road. It's just a short distance. And they're sitting on a grassy knoll right beside the road was this old hippie looking uh, Volkswagen bus that you, you, you would see pictures of from maybe from California, where all the hippies were, and they rode around in these Volkswagen buses, and they had flowers uh, on them and what have you. But now this bus didn't have any flowers. I'm just using that to uh, explain. But at any rate, I, I see that we get there, and I, I said, okay, I want to meet your friends. And she had an excuse that I couldn't do that. But uh, I did see Lyra, her friend that I had met. Uh, she was there. She kind of waved at me, and there were, I don't know, four or five others. Uh, I think three of them were uh, young, slender men, maybe maybe five, ten, six feet, something like that. Uh, the remarkable thing about it is every one of them looked just alike. They all had the same golden bronze natural complexion uh they all had very dark hair uh but i didn't get to get out and meet them because she made excuses to block me from doing that now uh so i, I let her out and i go on down the highway and and uh, uh i i was amazed uh because in looking in the rearview mirror after uh, I had gotten on down the road, I looked and the Volkswagen bus wasn't there. And I thought, my goodness, how did they drive away so quickly? But uh, they did. I remember that. I thought it unusual. And, and then, of course, years later, uh, under hypnosis with Barbara, we relived that experience. And what I saw under hypnosis was not the same as what I consciously remembered. What I saw was a small domed round UFO sitting there. Hmm. I, I, and these uh, people, these humans that I saw that appeared to me human were actually reptilian looking. Uh, now they were not like, uh, t-rex or anything like that they were kind of like small upright uh, alligators uh more like that but slender and they did they were wearing clothing but you could tell by the shape of their heads that it was uh reptilian uh kind of kind of like a, a a dinosaur head uh um, at, at any rate, that's what I remembered, and it was totally, I was shocked at, at, at that very much. Did they have a tail, Ted? No. If they did, it was tucked away inside their clothing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been hard. asked that before, and I actually don't ever remember a tail that I can think of right at the moment, anyway. So sometimes sometimes uh, things come back to me later. Uh, I don't recall things as easily as I did a few years ago. Well, I do regression, so I kind of know the questions to ask, like Carla would ask, like, 
a lot of details like their hands, how were their hands, their skin color, um, and did they have a snout or uh, no? How? No. Uh, I don't know how to describe their facial features that much. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't that close to oh. to them uh, that it, it the the front of their face reminded me they had like a a uh, you know if you look at a chimpanzee mm -hmm. uh, that something about the chimp's face reminded me of their face okay. uh, a li a little bit so there wasn't a snout but it was a little more significant uh, standing Protusion. out the, the chin area maybe just a little more than uh, a human would be i remember that and the, uh, color? the complexion the complexion was sort of like an olive greenish color that i remember uh they remember weren't gray that? looking they weren't gray looking they no. were they were they had a greenish color what about their hands? Do you well, the, the the hands, uh, well, they didn't have long fingers like we do. They were kind of stubby, and it, and, it, and it looked like maybe there was just about three of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't remember. I wasn't that close. Were they wearing shoes or boots or? I don't I don't remember that part. I, no. I, I you know I I actually don't. Okay. So, um, tell us how, what you remember of your first abduction, uh, when they first abducted you, at what age and what happened in that abduction? I, I'm going to say I was eight years old because I'm not exactly sure of the age, but it, I was around eight or nine. Mm -hmm. We were living uh, in rural Alabama, the nearest town was five miles away. So we were way out in the country on a uh, a large country farm that was owned by my grandmother. And uh, uh, I was crossing, I had been to my grandmother's house and I was crossing a cotton field adjacent and to go to the farmhouse we lived in. And about halfway across, uh, and it was a stormy, cloudy looking day. Uh, I, I remember even at, at that young age, something was pulling me to look up and I looked up and, I, and there was a light coming through these dark clouds and it was uh blinding in fact it was so blinding one of the things i remembered immediately was i had to stop to keep the light from hurting my eyes i had to put my fingers in front of my eyes and kind of peek through my fingers to see what this blinding light was coming out of that dark storm cloud and of course immediately when i did this i connected with this light and I found myself, I couldn't breathe. It was like I was being totally s smothered and I was, I was being lifted out of the cotton field. And I rode that light up in through what looked like a, a, a grate at the, in, at the bottom of this craft or, or this light. And then I went right through this grate. It, it opened and I went right through it. And then I was found myself standing in a room and I was there with uh, three grays. There was two short ones and there was a taller one. And they started talking to me and I answered them verbally and they told me not to do that. That, that, that hurt, hurt their ears uh, for me to just think what I wanted to say and they would hear me. And so we started communicating that way. And then they seated me by a window. And as I looked out, I could see my grandmother's farm and her house just being pulled further and further away. And it seemed like we were suddenly going at a tremendous 
rate of speed uh, to the point that uh, it looked to me, now remember I was eight years old, but it looked to me that I actually could see like we went into space and I could see the earth just moving further away like a small ball. And then the next thing I know, I was uh, I was looking out the window and I could see uh, in total darkness, I could see this uh, tremendously large. Uh, it, look, it looked like a blimp in the distance. It, it was kind of built like that. But as we got closer, I could see little crafts or little things coming in and out of portals. Although this, this, it, the closer we got, I realized how tremendously large this was. And then we we went into a portal and, we, and our, the craft I was in, it stopped. And then I was escorted out. And then from there we go, uh, how much depth do you want on this regression? Uh, because I, I, some of what I'm telling you came out of Barbara's regression. I didn't consciously remember all this. Oh, wow. Wow. And then you had a lot of abductions and they showed you a lot of stuff. What do you think they showed you all these um, activities? Let's say the cloning, the bases, the military bases, when they're working together with the military. Um, why do you think that they did that? I, I don't know for sure. I can only uh, speak hypothetically, and that is, I, I think it's part of their program. The ones that are showing all these things that we don't see, they don't show themselves, and I refer to them as the good angels or the good team, uh, but they don't come during the night and uh, rape us. They don't come during the night and and mutilate our bodies. Uh, they work very in very subtle ways in the background, but yet they're also affecting our lives uh, at the same time. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but they're not hurting me, or at least if they're hurting me, I don't I don't recall it. It seems to me they're doing good things more that, than the others. But it, but at any rate, uh, uh, this is, this is uh, how it all started with me. I think that they wanted, uh, they were ready in their program for more information to start coming forth as I think possibly a weapon to defeat what the negative ones are doing to us. Uh, because how are we going to ever fight this if we don't know what it's doing? How are we going to ever fight it if we don't know the truth behind all this? So at this point, I think it's a, what's happening to me is, and, and other people are coming forth is we are opening up to the truth of what's behind and what's involved in all of this. There has been dealing with humanity since the very beginning of humanity uh so that's my that's my feelings on it right um did they ever tell you why you no Never. barbara barbara asked me that so did carla they they very much wanted to know why me but actually if you look at all these other cases and then some of your own laura uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not the only one with this information. It's just with the ingenuity of, of Carla that we put it all together as a lifelong uh, thing. But I think y yours has probably been a lifelong thing also. I don't think I'm unique. Uh, I just think, I think, I think. That Carla... Carla probably was unique in the fact that she saw it so quickly and began to link it all together. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think in a sense, we're kind of like 
investigating them. Uh, they're watching us, but I think my main um, goal here is to get to learn who they are, what they are, what are they doing here? Why are they here? Why do they take certain people? Not everybody. I don't know if they're taking everybody. I'm assuming they must, or they probably will. But what really concerns me is the memory swipe, the erasing the memory, erasing our, our experiences. And that raises a, a red flag. Why are they erasing experiences? For instance, when they're abducting you, when they're taking you, and they're doing all these experiments on you, or they're uh, uh, doing cloning, <laughs> taking your conscious and putting it into another body. And we have so much to talk about uh, with your experiences, Jed, that it's going to take us like a lot, a long time to um, talk about your experiences, especially when they show you the cloning, when they killed you and they put you in another body, when they gave you another foot, a different size foot. There's so many, yeah, there's so many stuff, stores like, yes, <laughs> there's so many stuff. And I am, I am with Stuart. I am fascinated and I am a fan of yours. Um, I've had my experiences as well, but your experiences and what you remember under hypnosis, it, they're very, very extraordinary and they're very um, telling on who these beings are, what they're doing, because at what point did you, it dawned on you uh, who these uh, beings are or who they really are. And we still haven't figured out who they really are, but we're trying, we're investigating all this stuff and we're trying to come up with uh, a name for them. What do you think um, they were benevolent before and now you think otherwise? Well, let me back up first and comment on the fact you said uh, uh, about about why every everyone not does not uh, realize what's happened to them uh, and why me. Uh, okay, uh, the the eight year old abduction where I experienced my own death and cloning. And, and then taken out on that stage in front of all those creatures. Uh, could ordinary Joe deal with that? Now, I'm going to give an example. Barbara had a young man who lived in one of the Canadian provinces who went through, under hypnosis with her, basically the same experience and remembered, as she told me, almost identical my story. Mm -hmm. He went home and and killed himself because he could not deal with what he saw and relived under hypnosis. So we have to look at how this affects people. And, and I honestly can tell you it was so shattering to me what I relived that as Barbara was doing this uh, regression with me on that, I became hysterical under hypnosis and screaming and fleeing my arms and trying to get away. It took three people to hold me down. That's how hysterical I was. In fact, Barbara was told me later she was almost ready to call 911 uh, for emergency help. Now, I managed to survive that trauma only because of Carla and Barbara. Those two women were on the phone with me five times a day, every day after that, for God knows how long, because I was absolutely an emotional wreck. Everything I believed in 
was shattered. The angels I thought that had visited me were not angels. I saw non-emotional, soulless creatures and found myself in a room filled of hundreds of, of strange creatures that had no feeling whatsoever. I was in a soulless world where there was absolutely no emotion whatsoever. There was no love, nothing. It's just like if you were placed in a lion's den and the lions were hungry. Mm -hmm. They had no compassion, no feeling. You were their next meal. Now, most humans cannot endure this. And I wouldn't have endured it without those two women. They saved my life. Yes, indeed, they did. And what I really want to grasp is when you were in touch with uh, Maya, she showed emotions, Ted? <clears throat> that was questionable. Barbara asked me, you're the second person ever that's asked me that. Barbara asked me that. And I honestly say that I don't know that if she, that what she expressed was actual feelings for me or if she was a good actress. I don't remember, like I could, like here I'm online with you and I have feelings for both you and Stuart today right now I care about you we're all friends mm -hmm. I didn't feel that connection with Maya but at the same time her friendliness and her uh, behavior was warming in a way because it was so friendly but I can't say that I actually felt emotions from her that's the best way I know how to explain it. Interesting, interesting. Because you being a psychic, you will catch on the energies of other people. Like, for instance, we're talking here. I feel the energies around you and Stuart. It, did you feel any, any different energies from her? What vibe did you get from her? Uh or was it empty well she was sort of mind controlling uh, looking back and 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 the best i remember she was she sort of was mind controlling in the sense that she made me so curious about the things she would say or whatever i was so captivated by this that i didn't really think in detail about her i don't i don't uh would i want to spend the day with her no I had other friends that I'd rather have been with and have fun. Maya wasn't exactly what I would call fun, but she was certainly intriguing. She, she would certainly arouse my curiosity about her. I wanted to know more about her, but at the same time, I can't say that she's somebody that I would want to, uh, uh, call spend the day with. Of coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just ask, uh, Ted, um, how often did you meet Maya without Lyra being present? With Lyra being present or yeah, without? Like, like what was like, how often did you see Maya without Lyra? Without Lyra? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> oh, probably five times. Without Lyra. Okay. Okay. So I know all the attention is on Maya. Okay intriguing yeah. woman talking to ted but lyra was there also and i feel like there isn't enough uh scrutiny put on put on her uh i've been trying to think about why she, why she could possibly be there okay and the one i keep coming back to is security it's kind of like you know in star trek when they go on an away mission one of the rules is they can't go alone they have mm -hmm. to go with a group like cops 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I always I always felt that was Lyra's role there was for security. But you know, Ted, when I, you mentioned, I, I never thought of that before. That's very good on your part. I I never thought of because she had very little to say, and she never tried to get friendly with me as Maya did. She was just kind of stood to the side. And now that you say it, she probably was a security blanket for Maya. Yeah, yeah, but m- maybe also part of this mind control as well, kind of like a dual awesome. job, right? But what I've investigated, and when I've uh, when I've talked to people, they tell me they always come in two in pairs. There's always two. Okay. Uh, they're never alone. It's rarely when they're alone, um, okay. but they are always in pair. And you know how you have a handler. And then you have the the another person. We well, have the handler, and then you have the person. For instance, right. this was Maya was your handler, Ted, and you were the other person too. You yeah. know what I mean? Like Maya and Lyra, uh, they're a team. It's always yeah. a team. They're always a team. They team up. Yeah. yeah. I never thought of that. And I was going to ask about Lyra because I don't remember. Uh, reading about Lyra or knowing about Lyra until now. So who's Lyra? She was always with Maya. Well, <clears throat> the first time I met uh, Maya was uh, there in Sun Valley Lodge where I was working. And uh, I was going down a, a hallway. I worked, I was a room service waiter and I was taking uh some food to a room to serve and uh, i met these two girls and immediately in 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 meeting up with them uh and they were wearing maids uniforms both of them that uh the maids who work there in the lodge they wore and they were kind of blue and white checkered uniforms and we met her, and I, I can't remember, but I, I think Maya initiated, like, hey, how are you? And and I, I briefly stopped because I couldn't stop very long. I was taking food. I had to deliver it. But uh, anyway, she kind of introduced herself and said they were new employees there, and, and they were working as maids in the lodge. And I said, oh, oh well, maybe we can meet up later or some general chit chat that meant nothing. And we went on our way, but that was the first time that I saw them and they, they were both together. And then I would run into Maya at different times when she was alone. But uh, I have thought of this and, and I shared this with Carla and, uh, and Barbara. Uh, once I had seen under hypnosis, the technology that they have, and, and can use uh lyra may have been there the entire time on those meetings where i met up with maya and Lyra wasn't present she may have been there but she may have been hiding under that technology where i couldn't see her so or that, another another body nearby yeah, right i mean that's a possibility i don't i certainly don't know that that's true but it's something i've thought of and there's also the uh, you know Maya is the Indian god of illu- Indian goddess of illusion. Okay, Maya's mm-hmm. palace. Yeah. But I haven't heard anything anyone come up with anything for Lyra. What's the connection there? If there is a connection, I don't know. I imagine. Uh, you know what? I believe Barbara knew of one, but I can't remember at the moment. Oh really? Yeah. I, the I believe... only thing that pops in my head is the Lyrans, the Lyran race. Different Maybe. alien race. Yeah, different alien race. Something more uh, mythological, though. Yeah. Because, uh, like, Maya. Maya is the name of the Indian goddess of illusion. And Maya was an illusion herself. You know, she was a reptilian posing as a as a human woman. Um, I wonder what uh, Barbara found out on Lyra, though. That's interesting. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. I wish I could remember. Maybe it'll come to me later, Stu. Yeah. Sometimes these things do. Yeah. 
Now, I want to talk about the love bite situation. Can we talk about the love bite? Okay. Sure. How did it sure. start? How did it start with you, the love bite? Okay. I'm 15 and years old. Love bite? I'm 15 years old. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and in fact, I think actually I was 14, not quite 15, maybe a couple of months from being 15. But at any rate, that's how young I was. <clears throat> Uh, in, a, in a new community, a new school, I, I wasn't close to anyone. There was no girl in particular I was interested in in school, <clears throat> none whatsoever. In fact, having a girlfriend right then, was I wouldn't even normally have entertained that idea. I just wasn't mature enough yet uh, for that. But the house that my family was renting was across the street from a public school and uh now i was i was starting i was in the ninth grade and uh in just starting in high school and so this this school was a grammar school it was for kids that were under 10 and but there was a a, a rather large playground with it and this playground was right across the street and that you could walk from my yard of my house there right across the street into the playground and uh, a lot of kids you know even the bigger kids my age would go out there and they would shoot baskets play volleyball do different things out there you know their time away from their school but one night we had not been there that terribly long living there uh, the angels came, and I remember <clears throat> they came in, into my bedroom. There were three of them. It was in the middle of the night, and I raised up, and I was terrified, and then I was frozen. I couldn't move, and I do remember, and it, I remember more in detail because I was writing something for Stuart about the colors of, of purple and, and green, and it, it became a little more the memory came back a little stronger for me but but uh there these uh beings that came into my room uh i thought at first when i started remember that, that they dressed in that color but actually they didn't they they were typical grays under hypnosis but there was an overseer with them who was very tall and this overseer wore those colors but the colors were not as vivid as they had been in that uh abduction that happened in, on my grandmother's farm when i was eight years old but they were the same colors but they were softer and i remember the, the this same being was in charge inside this craft that I was taken to out there on the school playground. And when I was taken in there, I saw myself, uh, a, a young girl that lived right up two or three houses away from me. Uh, Jill was her name. Uh, uh, we were in the, the same grade there at school. And uh, I saw her, I saw a red, red haired girl who I still am friends with today, but I won't name her. Uh, and then there was, now we lived in a period of racial segregation in the South. So there were no black families in my neighborhood, but uh, this neighborhood was on top of a, a big hill. And down below was a, a ghetto area of black families. And one of the black girls came on Saturdays and cleaned our house. And uh, she was uh, a very pretty girl. She was a couple of years maybe older than I, I was. But they had her in one of those tubes. We were all in tubes. 
And so they had brought one from down the hill from the ghetto, and they had these others that lived in the neighborhood right around the school there besides me, and we were all in tubes. The colors purple and gold were worn by this leader. Now, what what else do you need to know about that? Oh, well, how did the love fight start it? Oh, Remember? yeah, I got, sorry, I got sidetracked. I'm good at that. That's okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> this obviously was another cloning thing going on, but it was somewhat differently the way it was done. Uh, instead of being taken to a mothership for cloning, they brought the clones to us where we were. And they did the transition there, right there, within walking distance of my house in that in that uh, smaller craft. But it, at any rate, when when Jill, they they walked me up, and it seems like I sort of disappeared into the body of myself in that tube and i remember that they took something like a little wand and they pulled part of the energy field out of the tube that jill was in and they like circled it like like they were it reminded me of like uh, knitting needles and they were knitting something into my energy field but uh, they did not take mine back and do the same to her. They were pulling hers into mine. So then after this, and, and I wake up, you know, the next day, and I think, well, the angels have been here again. Uh, oh, my goodness. What happened? The Internet went dead again. You're there. Okay. You're there. I'm okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So anyway... I start back to school right after that, and uh, immediately at school, when I, I exchange glances with Jill, my heart jumps out of my chest. I'm in love. If you've ever seen the uh, the cartoon with Pepe Le Pew, yeah, years back, you know, uh, Pepe said, "Face it, darling, it's bigger than both of us." And uh, I, that's the way I felt. And but I got no response from Jill, other than normal school friendliness. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, I just wanted this girl to be my girlfriend so bad. I, I thought about her all the time. I dreamed about her. I made excuses to be around her at school, but it was never reciprocated. I never, she was never unkind or mean to me in any way, you know, she just wasn't interested in me. It was, it was not a mutual agreement here. So this went on all for, for years till we got out of high school and then we went to Sun Valley. So actually it ended with when Maya came into the picture and I'm not exactly sure if Maya did it or it was just time for me to let it go. But either way, uh, it's when it ended. It's during this period. During this period, how many years passed by? You well, said? okay, it went on. Let's see, four, five, six years. Six years six passed years. by, yeah. and then and I was in emotional agony and in, uh, in love. I was like a love sick puppy. And then what happened that? you said that Maya came in and she kind of like broke the spell. Well, Maya, Maya is the one responsible for me deciding I had been four years in Sun Valley. Uh, you know, I was getting older. Uh, I needed to go back home and think about my education and, and, uh, and a career. And I, Jill had joined me there at sun valley and you know i thought maybe we would have the relationship i'd always wanted but it didn't happen and uh, she was dating other people and we got into somewhat of a uh not an argument exactly but a, a kind of a serious talk in which she 
she said to me, because I had tried to explain to her at some point why I felt that way about her and, uh, and, and hope that she would remember the schoolhouse event. She, she remembered nothing about it at that time whatsoever. She remembered absolutely nothing and thought I was crazy uh, about the school playground abduction. Uh, but and, and she said to me that these were my angels. They were not her angels. And she didn't see or understand the same thing that I was seeing. And she wasn't trying to hurt me. She was just being honest. And, 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 and you know, so that made me realize it was never going to happen. But Maya was involved at the same time. But Jill, Jill left Sun Valley before I did. It was uh, shortly, shortly after that, she left and returned back to Alabama and continued uh, on her education. Uh, now, years later in our friendship with Jill, and we, we remained friends, uh, we rode around that neighborhood where she had grown up and where I, my family had lived for a few years there next to the playground. And we parked the car and we walked out on the playground and she went to a certain spot. Now keep in mind, this was a very large playground. They could actually play sport games out there. It was that large. But there we were, we walked out on this playground and Jill walked straight to the point where the UFO was sitting that night. And she turned around at me and looked and she said it was sitting right here, wasn't it? And I said, yes, you do remember. She said, no, I don't. But I just know this is where it was. So that was the closest I got out of her recognition that this had happened. Wow. But during all these abductions, you had a memory of these things happening to you at the time. But then when Carla came and started doing the regression, the hypnotic regression, that's when you got to see the real Maya, the real experiences that you were having. But oh, you I, re I the remembered the events, but they were all covered in screams. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I, I had told my family because uh, uh, there when the eight year old in the cotton field abduction took place, I had physical changes after after that uh, because of the substance, the green liquid they had given, which killed me, set me on fire inside to the point of excruciating pain. And after that, I didn't remember the green liquid, but I would wake up screaming in the night and I would tell my parents I was burning inside. I'm eight years old now, but I would wake up screaming and tell them I'm burning inside and, and, and just get almost hysterical. And my mother would actually bathe me in alcohol trying to calm the, the fire I was feeling. Yeah, and, and, if you, and, if, like if you had a fever or something. Yeah, and then uh, uh, I came down first with the mumps and got over that and, and then uh, 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 three or four months after that I got the measles and so my mother takes me back to the clinic where Children are given inoculations and they check the records. And I had been given uh, the inoculations for these diseases uh, at, at the uh, required time that the state health department had required. These, well, we had to have them before we get into school. And uh, so they had their own record that I had been given these, but yet I'm having these diseases again. So it's a fear that I would get polio. They gave them all to me again. Thank God I didn't get polio. But uh, uh, 
so those were physical things uh going on with me plus uh my family even my grandmother you know uh, up in you said that i was not the same little boy as that eight-year-old that i was different yeah. and 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 uh, every one of these visitations that i had where there was a cloning procedure my personality altered or changed somewhat afterwards and usually in a more emotional subdued way in, in in which i was like suffering depression interesting interesting um so maya came and how did she break the spell with jill well we didn't talk we didn't talk about jill uh maya and i jill was never mentioned no one word i'm i'm just saying my interaction with her and her uh getting me interested in returning back to alabama to go back to school and further my education uh all of that it just seemed like all of a sudden uh i wasn't interested in jill anymore you so i couldn't say my actually did it maybe she didn't do it maybe it was just time for me to re let it go but it was at that time that Molly was in my life that it happened i think she reset your mind and redirected you towards your goals in life and then well, I, jill was I, gone and you yeah. just moved along yeah. towards what you wanted in life or what right. they wanted or the what they wanted yeah because she's the one that pushed them and and told you uh to start thinking about your life you know what i mean like education and uh she's the one that eventually told you about the psychic um abilities right. Mm -hmm. right yeah and okay. and and then contributing to that after i, I returned to uh alabama psychic events uh begin to happen in dream states and and uh just verbal communication with other people i would suddenly real realize something about them uh you know things would happen as as a co-worker i had a part-time job i was back in school but i was working part-time and a co-worker i suddenly turned to her because it just it like it was like uh when you hit enter on your computer and it just saves that it's like a rush in my head i saw this white cat run in front of this woman and she was driving and i warned her about it and the very next day she comes rushing in at work to tell me that that event happened that she had uh but she didn't wasn't able to stop the car in time and she actually ran over the kitten and it died but uh, uh it, things like that begin to happen that i was not soliciting and it was kind of scary to me actually because I, I didn't understand it enough to know what to do about it or was there anything i should be doing about it right right do you have any questions to her or you want to add to that uh just that they showed you something that you couldn't possibly change is the only thing I, I, I got from it. Like, what's the point of in giving, showing you that, telling that woman, but then the events, like, you can't change it. The cat is still going to die. Well, that's exactly what I came to realize over the years. You, you hit the nail on the head because another psychic thing happened was, uh, I had stayed uh, on campus in a dorm for one summer after I had gotten back, and my roommate was a young man, uh, a very nice young man who actually married the governor's the, the governor George Wallace of Alabama. Uh, he married George Wallace's daughter, and so we he came by my house to with her one day uh after i was back living at home at my parents home which was their house by the way was uh 
this was a different house where the school ground event we had moved to a different part uh and and we were right there on the university of alabama campus uh but uh this young man brought his wife who was governor wallace's daughter and they came by my house to see me but we hadn't seen each other or talked in a while that very night after their visit i saw a casket in the state capitol rotunda with with the alabama state flag covering it and i said to my family the governor is going to die well governor wallace didn't die while in office but his wife ran Governor Lurleen Wallace went for governor and was elected. And while in office, she developed cancer and she died. And that scene that I saw of that casket with the flag over it was televised uh, nationwide. Uh, and we looked at it there in the living room of my parents' home. And I told them, this is what I saw. Okay, well, what point was there, Stuart? in my seeing that if i could do nothing about it uh the only thing i can see was it was to excite me on my psychic ability and get me to move forward with it because this is what some force wanted okay well if if maya wanted me and told me and tricked me into seeing that i had psychic abilities uh maybe that force may have something to do with these psychic dreams i don't know but i've often thought of that yeah and also it kind of raises questions about whether people genuinely genuinely have psychic ability or is it just these beings you know stories of abductees well, going back to the ship can, can yeah, i go for, go for that it. yeah okay under hypnosis i saw where my mind was altered it had implants put in it and where i could receive telepathic instructions about my psychic ability and they would put strange looking headphones on my head and i would feel a rush of information just like filling my brain it, it, it was so fast it was al almost painful to receive so much information at one time and so i learned from what i was seeing that and this is one of the reasons i stopped doing metaphysical psychic work because i told barbara this is not a natural thing for me they have altered me so that i can be this way and so I don't do it anymore. Other than if something just naturally pops up, you know, I might, if I see that it has some value to it, I might share it with someone. But as far as doing readings, uh, psychic games, I just don't do it anymore. And I, I have developed somewhat now of a mental block against it, uh, where I just kind of shut down if I'm put in that position. Now, in saying that, though, there could be a case to be made about the good side that you spoke of using the same uh, uh, people and their psychic abilities to push their agenda as well. So it's not always negative, is it? No. No. Because I have given some I have given some worthwhile information to people uh, in the past in which they got medical assistance and it possibly could have even saved their lives because they listened to me but you have to look at it like this if nothing i told people ever came true i would have no followers there, it, there would not be a, a metaphysical program there to enhance people because nothing would ever good would happen with it so yeah. they have to throw in something like that all in there with it in order to entice people you you see what i'm saying everything can't be negative or nobody's certainly going to want to be psychic little breadcrumbs you know what? 
Lure him, little breadcrumbs to lure him in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, yeah. now I've, I've had people ask me, well, do you think that's true for everybody? And I can't say that. I only know what happened to me, what I feel it, it means to me, what I saw, what I experienced. And this is my interpretation. Uh, other people may have natural psychic ability. I don't know, but I doubt it. I think it's all altered. It, it, they alter. I saw in so many abductions so much human altering going on. It's why I am a little bit skeptical of a hybrid program. I'm, 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 I, they can they can take these children or what hybrid children or whatever, and and they can take human children and alter them and make them that way. Uh, so I'm not saying hybrid is, is not real. I, I, I don't know enough to say that, but I'm not convinced that it's 100% real. Well, yeah, the cloning and the way they manipulate the bodies, um, you would think if the hybrids are already mm, interfered with, in the fetus then yeah that is a true hybrid but if the human person the body is interfere when they're older then that will be considered just a humanoid being uh, put all this um abilities we'll call them abilities but it's technology that they have that they have yeah. to bring that body into their their ships and enhance them. So I wonder if the hybrids have it in their DNA in their because they've already manipulated the fetus. So I'm wondering by doing the hybrids, they don't have to do the um, abductions anymore and take the humans and do it while they're mature enough eight years old, 10 years old, I don't know, whenever they come in and take a person and start enhancing them. It's like the same thing as the military people where they have the super soldiers, where they enhance the, the, the soldiers uh, to have extra strength or um, usually these soldiers have psychic abilities. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if because they have either natural psychic abilities or what is it why a lot of the contactees a lot of the abducted people they have disability like i have it you have it Stuart has it um i don't know if you realized it Stuart, but you do no, i don't have us <laughs> yeah you do but uh, we'll tell you later <laughs> we'll tell you how and why just the fact that you found Ted and and you guys uh, were like friends instantly, that tells me well, that there is something with well, you. I'm convinced he was manipulated to contact. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think it was an accident. <laughs> oh no, there is no there is no coincidences in this world. I I am very aware of that. Yeah. But how about we leave this? right now and then next time if you want to come back in the show and we can talk about something else cloning hybrids um all the stuff that all the experiences that you had and just different subjects so we don't make okay. it as long as we can okay. go on and on, on, on. Well, I, have a, I have a question for you see uh Stuart and and laura do you think i'm a hybrid Hmm. Do, uh, no, I don't think so. No, that pops in my head to no, because well, remember they changed him. Remember they 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 changed his body. Uh, yeah, but I don't think he's so the original. The, yeah, might have been a hybrid, yeah. but the one that they brought back, yes. Mm. All right, yeah. there might might have there's definitely been some alterations, all right? Oh yeah. <laughs> like they did it with uh him and Jill, and I suppose they did it with the psychic ability as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Strictly a hundred percent human, maybe not, maybe ninety-eight percent. Yeah, yeah. 
we got to dig into that. We got to dig into that. And I, I really think I need to talk to you, Ted and Stuart, and see where or what we can come up with. Like, mm. for instance, I can ask questions like Carla. I, I believe I have something of Carla in me that attracted me to you guys. And because I keep on asking similar questions that Carla would ask or or uh, Barbara. So there's definitely- You're doing, you're doing a good job. Yeah, thank you. I know there's something going on. I've had that intuition since the first day I talked to you. So mm -hmm. there's something going on. But anyways, thank you guys. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Stuart. And hopefully you guys can come back again and we'll talk about a different subject, a, a different, um, we can talk about the cloning. We can talk about whatever you like to talk about, Ted, and whatever you feel comfortable talking about. Well, I'd, I'd rather you ask the questions. Okay. I like, will. like we did today. I thought today has gone very good. I've, I've enjoyed this. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for accepting the invitation and coming to my show, which I'm going to translate and then I'm going to post it and I'll send it to you guys. Okay. So you guys can post it. It's going to be in English and with a translation. So, okay. Sorry, tell right, us where thanks. we can find you. Where can we find you? Oh, um, we have a YouTube channel. We have a podcast called Alien Talk. Uh, we're on most platforms, um, Spotify, Apple. I think we're nearly up to 40 episodes there, so people have a bit to get through. Okay. So whoever wants to go and watch all their episodes, they, what they talk about is really interesting, and it's mostly of what we're going to talk about here. But thank you so much, guys, and I'll, I can't wait to see you guys again and talk to you guys about all these subjects. All right. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having okay. us on. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Right. Bye.